Hello and welcome back to another revision lesson on the unification of Germany section. This is a unit one lesson titled Economic Development in the 1840s. So today's lesson is going to look at how the German economy developed during the 1840s and how it began to change from how it had been from the hundreds of years beforehand. So what are our key outcomes today? We need to be able to understand the policies of protectionism and free trade. We want to be able to evaluate the growth across different economic sectors. And we also want to start to consider the impact of growth on econo economic policy. The key words I want you to take away from today are protectionism, customs duties and free trade policy. So let's start off by talking about trade policy. In a simplified version here, there are basically two forms of trade policy. You can either have protectionism or free trade. Protectionism is a policy where a state protects its internal producers against cheap imports by levering high custom duties. So what does that mean? What this means is that a country wants to protect the businesses that it has within its own country. So to do this, it tries to tax any cheap goods coming in from abroad to make them more expensive than the goods produced in its country. Let's use a more modern example. Any toys produced in the UK today, plastic toys, will be more expensive to produce than those mass produced in China. And what this means is that businesses and shops can sell these Chinese toys at a cheaper price while still making a large profit. And that means that any British manufacturer of toys wouldn't have the opportunity, really, to sell as many. They won't get as many orders as the shops won't make as much money. And people would have to spend more money to buy their toys. So if the UK had a protectionist system, they would increase the amount of tax on those Chinese toys to make them more expensive than the British toys. So protectionism is a way of making goods that come from abroad cost more money than those made in your country. The complete opposite of this is a free trade policy. This is a policy, usually with the agreement of two or more parties, so two or more countries, of not levying customs duties in order to promote greater trade between states. So when we're talking about free trade, we can really think about the EU and the idea that French companies can sell their goods in the UK without having to pay any customs, any tax on those goods. And the same for British countries into countries like Germany, France, Italy. And it was that agreement here that allowed for more trade to occur. There were more customers for each business. If you imagine, again, if we go back to our British toy manufacturer here, the British toy manufacturer can sell toys all over Europe. So it has a much bigger market. So therefore, in theory, it's able to make much greater profits. Now, we usually see protectionism in a state where its economy is struggling due to cheap imports. So if there is a one country which is getting flooded by cheaper products from abroad, they will often adopt a protectionism policy to protect their workers and to help keep jobs. So in the early 1800s in Germany, or in Europe even, there are a couple of key points that we must talk about. The first thing we need to realise is that the Industrial Revolution in Britain had given them an ability to mass produce goods much cheaper and faster. So Britain had already gone through its Industrial Revolution and it was churning out so many mass produced goods, it was flooding other states throughout Europe and the world. Now, the German Confederation was worried about the damage that could be done by this influx of cheap goods from Britain. So what trade policy might they implement? Well, in this situation, the German Confederation would look more towards a protectionist policy, a way of stopping or making these British goods more expensive so that the people living in the German Confederation buy German goods and therefore support German businesses. So was this good for all? Well, no. Okay, so though it might have helped some small German industrial businesses, it's actually proved quite negative for many states within the German Confederation. Thanks to the agricultural revolution that had already happened in Germany, 
farmers were producing record surpluses. So because there was new farming techniques and tools available, they were growing many more crops than they were beforehand. And this meant that they had more crops than they could sell within Germany. So a lot of these farmers wanted to sell their crops and produce to other countries. But due to the protectionist policy that they had implemented on other countries, those same countries had high taxes on German goods. So this meant that farmers would have favoured a more free trade policy, which meant that they could export their cheap farm produce out to other countries. Right, so what was the German economy like in 1840? So by the time we get to 1840, we are starting to see the beginning of some industry in Germany. Agriculture is still going to be the main source of the economy, but there is starting to become a growth in industry. So this growth isn't geographically spread across Germany. Some areas are going to benefit a lot more from this growth than others. So states in the northwest of the Confederation such as Hanover and the Western Territories of Prussia around the Ruhr, were, uh, were rich in natural resources, and they were also close to the large ports of Hamburg and Brenham. This provided the natural environment for heavy industry, particularly steel. So what this means is, the areas of Hanover and Prussia were close to this Ruhr area, and we looked at this in GCSE. The Ruhr was rich in coal and minerals that could be taken out of the ground, and they could be produced into new products like steel. Okay, The second benefit they had is that this area was close to the major ports in Germany on that northern border. And this meant that not only could they produce the goods, but they could transport them quickly onto ships and ship them around the rest of the world. So they could sell this steel across much of Europe, over to America, and so this made these states much more powerful when it came to industry. When railways, railways began to develop from the mid-1830s onwards, this provided further stimulus for this area. So this area started to invest heavily in railways so they could move the goods from the rural area up to the port. Again, increasing the amount of product they could produce and the amount that they could sell abroad and transport all over Europe. An example of this is the Krupp family, who started making steel in this area at the beginning of the 19th century, and they became one of the largest steel producing companies in the world. So here again, we've got one sort of company in this area that became the biggest in the world at producing steel. So we can really see that this rural area was very valuable. So any states that had land in this area had an economic benefit. They were better and quicker into industry. Again, for Prussia, in the southwest, you had Silesia, another area rich in natural resources. And Saxony, who is a state just below Prussia, they also had a tradition of heavy industry. So here we have countries like Saxony and Hanover with good areas, and Prussia having two key industrial areas. Their land in the Ruhr, on the west side of Prussia, and on the eastern side of Prussia, Silesia. Away from these areas, the German Confederation had a very traditional economy based on agriculture. So as we leave this sort of northern part of Germany, the main industry is agriculture. It comes to farming. Okay? And states in the southwest, such as Bavaria and Württemberg, depended on a wide range of agriculture, as did the eastern parts of Prussia, where the Junkers lived, west of the Oder River. Now you might say, why am I talking about Prussia's economy being good when they've got farms the same as Bavaria and Württemberg? Well, Prussia's economy was more balanced. Okay? They had the option of both, both agriculture and industry. And that gave them a very strong economy because it didn't mean their money was coming from one point. It meant if there was a strike by workers in industry, they still had agriculture to have an income for their taxes. And vice versa, if there was a famine where the crops didn't grow that year, then industry would still provide some tax to the government. So they had quite a well-balanced state. Whereas countries like Bavaria and Württemberg were so reliant on crop production that if it failed, then they wouldn't make any income that year. 
Austria had a largely agricultural economy and its production of manufactured uh, goods was extremely outdated. So what we do see in some areas of Bavaria and Austria is artisan goods. So things like, I want you to think of pottery, clock making, things that took a long time and were done by hand. Now, this wasn't good enough now in this new state that had such a or new world where mass production was a thing. These states just couldn't keep up with having workers work by hand. So who would be the winners of an industrial revolution in Germany? Well, first of all, we would have places like Hanover, Prussia, Hamburg, and Bremen. And the losers would be Bavaria, Württemberg, uh, and Austria. Also, I've, I've had a look at Prussia, because the traditional power in Prussia came from the eastern part of Prussia, the Junkers and their estates. But with the Industrial Revolution, we would see areas in northwest of Prussia and southwest of Prussia becoming much richer. So this area would lose a lot of power and money. Right. Let's have a look for protectionism or free trade. Well, traditionally, protectionism has been in place in Germany. Not only did it protect the state's producers, but it also served the needs of the ruling elite. It made sure that the money stayed in the country. It made sure that they made the profits, and it stopped anybody becoming too rich to challenge them. Trade guilds favoured protectionism because it meant their members had a secure place in the market. If you are a clockmaker as we've spoken before you want protectionism so that your clocks can be sold in your country and you're not importing cheaper clocks from elsewhere landowners favored protectionism as it maintained a stable and relatively high price for agricultural surplus so there were some landowners that thought actually in germany what they could do is they could control how much of their surplus they sell and therefore they can control the prices if it's a global sale, then you are tied into whatever the price of wheat is at that point. If lots of countries have overproduced wheat, then it might be worth less. But when you're controlling all of the aspects within a country, you can obviously charge as much as you want for that surplus. So they quite liked the idea of maintaining a protectionist identity. Monarchs liked protectionism as it was a good source of income from the royal purse. These goods were being all sold in Germany, which meant all the taxes on the sale went to them. So they were making good profit. They didn't want to see this money going abroad. Landowners who could produce large surpluses needed new markets, however. So if you were a landowner that could produce lots of surplus, then you wanted to be able to trade abroad. So these landowners would, pay, would uh, support fair tr or free trade. So we see here that, that difference between different landowners, okay? So if you were able to produce a small surplus, you wanted to be able to sell that in Germany for high profits. However, landowners with bigger surpluses would make a lot more money being able to trade abroad. Prussia favoured a free trade approach, whereas Austrian policy was one for protectionism. So here we see another problem between Prussia and Austria. Prussia, with its industry, wants to move towards a more free trade system. Austria wants to remain, maintain the protectionism view. And you've got to remember that these policies will cover most of the German Confederation. It will be the German Confederation that come up with some of these rules. So Prussia really wants to change this and go for free trade. So again, we've got an area of tension here between both Prussia and Austria. Okay, so we're now going to discuss why Prussia was able to have economic dominance in the German area. And this mainly comes down to geographical advantages. So number one, uh, Prussia had made lots of territorial gains in the West that gave it a clear advantages. One of the main advantages was that this land bordered France, and therefore Prussia was able to take the lead role in trade negotiations with France. This opened up a lot of Prussia's production market to a much bigger area as they could trade easily into France. It also had diversity um, that protected its economic activities. Collapse of certain markets and natural disasters such as harvest failure weren't as big a problem. So what we've got to understand here is because Prussia had both industry and 
agriculture if the crops failed one year they still had industry bringing in money if the industry collapsed they still had their agriculture there to bring money um, and again we're going to look in a minute they also had a diversity of crops which really minimized that risk of harvest failure three they had the ability to dominate all of germany's natural resources why is this important because a lot of other states didn't have the same access Prussia had control of both the Rhineland and Silesia, the two big iron and coal producing areas. This gave them a massive advantage when it came to industry. On top of this, Prussia also had huge areas of land for growing crops, meaning that it could dominate the agricultural market, especially in the northern part of Germany. 4. It also had control over the major rivers. Now this is important, as these were the rivers that enabled a uh, state to pass their goods easily from their states up to the ports in the north. As you can imagine, it can be very time consuming and costly to move goods by um, wagon at this time, but being able to put them on steam powered ships uh, would make it much, much quicker. Finally, number five, Prussia had a good diversity in crops. Now because Prussia was split into the two areas on the east and the west, each area was better for growing different types of crops. So in east of Prussia, they grew sort of the traditional type of wheat. And that was really important because that was obviously used for bread. They could sell that for a lot of money. A lot of countries wanted it. But they also had crops in the new land in the west where they could grow rye, barley, hops and grapes. Now again, this is a big advantage because that means if one of their crops fails, if the wheat fails, they've still got other crops to fall back onto to raise taxes. On top of that, if there is an abundance of wheat produced each year, they have other crops to sell. So some states in Germany really relied on growing one type of crop. And if everybody managed to grow that crop that year, it would be worth less because there's so much of it around. Whereas Prussia had such a range of crops, it really helped them develop their agriculture. Right, don't worry about the task here, but I just wanted to have a look at this table. Okay, now we can see actually how the increase in agriculture happened within the German Confederation during this time. So we can see in 1800, okay, the land, uh, the amount of tons of crops produced was 14,000. By 1846, this had risen to 29,000. So a big increase there. It's the same in livestock that almost doubles between 1800 and 1840s, going up from 7,000 to 14,000 tons of livestock again in the labor info if we look at the labor force at the end we can see that actually the labor force doesn't increase by that much okay so though the labor force does increase it doesn't increase by the amount of the produce produced so this shows that there is starting to become a revolution in farming this this agricultural revolution has happened which allows uh, farmers to produce more with less and that is a key part of Prussia's economy it's able to produce these mass amount of crops across its country without using too much more of its labor force so any other laborers are able to go into industry okay now let's have a look at some of Prussia's and Austria's um, industrial stats so as we can see uh, the German Confederation so those states minus Austria uh, were producing 1.6 million tons of coal uh, between 1825 and 29. And mainly driven by Prussian investment, that goes up to 6.1 by 1845. So we can see there's been a massive growth here in the amount of coal being produced in the German Confederation. If we compare that to Austria, Austria was producing 0.2 million tons, and that's only increased to 0.8 million. So we can see Austria really starting to lag behind here in coal production. Now remember, coal is really important, not only for power, but for turning iron into steel and smelting it and making uh, factories work. So having coal is really important to having a well-developed um, in industry. And we can see that here with the UK. The UK is increased from 22 million to 48 million. And as we know, they're going through their big industrial revolution at this time. So you can see the amount of coal they've got to power those factories and that mass production is huge. And even the German Confederation have a long way to go, but they're a lot closer than Austria. We can say the same here about pig iron production. Again, the German Confederation has increased much more 
than Austria. And it, the UK, again, has taken a real big lead in this area. So they're all playing catch up. But Austria, as we can see, is well behind. The final one on this is probably the most important, and that is talking about railway in kilometers. Now, the German Confederation only had 469 kilometers of railway in 1840. The UK at this point has two, over 2000, but by 1845, in five years, the German Confederation is catching up with the UK. Yes, the UK have increased their railway further, but five years to get from 400 to 2000 kilometers is massive, and that shows a big increase. Um, whereas Austria, we don't see the same level of increase. Now, why is railway so important? Railway is so important because it makes moving of goods much easier. It means you can get the coal from the mines to the factories quicker. It means you can get the, the produce from those factories to the ports quicker, so you can ship it around the world or deliver it to other states within the Confederation. So it really helps drive the economy. It also allows to be, you to be able to move people with expertise, so people who know the best coal mining techniques can travel around Germany and help implement those. They can help set up factories all over Germany and have them linked together by railway. So this gives the German Confederation as a whole a much better position when we're talking about industry than Austria. Okay, so let's go over the final parts of this lesson then. So what are the final questions? Who is still the dominant power in Europe? Well, that is still the UK. They're going through their own industrial revolution at this time. And so they are still in the lead here. People are like Brunel are driving forward the British industry and their empire is helping them provide with lots of raw materials to work with. So there is no question that the UK is still the most dominant economic power in Europe. Which country is losing the economic race at this time? That would be Austria. Austria are failing to go into industry, okay? And what that means is they're relying on their agriculture still. They're relying on the same economy that they have done for hundreds of years beforehand, which has always served them well. But with this new industry coming in, they are not going to be able to compete with other economic powers. What do these figures show is beginning to happen in Germany? Well, what we're beginning to see is the rest of the German Confederation, led by Prussia, starting to push more and more into industry. In fact, when we look at Germany, those states closest to Prussia are seeing the biggest increases in their industry, while those closer to Austria are seeing less and less increase in industry. So how might these events uh, change the political dynamic within Germany? Well, if Prussia manages to take control of the economy, that means they're going to be raising far more money to put into their army. They'll be able to make closer ties with other states around them because they will rely on each other for trade. Whereas Austria is a far off threat. Those that are trading with Germany, they or with Prussia, rely on them for their economy. OK, so this could really change it. If Prussia are able to take control of industry, then Austria will lose power within the German Confederation. As always, any questions, come and see me or drop me an email. And I hope you found this lesson useful. Thank you very much. And I will see you on the next revision video.